What's up guys, Kudokun here. Today we're going to get started on a new series I'm lovingly calling Metamorphosis. In this show, we're going to go back and look at an old card game's metagame, where it began, why it began, and how it eventually evolved. And what better game to start with than my personal favorite card game, the Naruto CCG. A couple of small notes before we get started. First of all, while I do consider myself pretty well versed in the Naruto CCG, this is mainly based on my perspective. So if you experience the game differently, or if you have more information to add, please leave it in the comment section below. The more info we get, the better. Secondly, this video is going to assume you already know how the Naruto CCG works. If you don't know how it works, I recommend looking up a small guide or maybe even the video on my channel to get yourself caught up so you can follow along with the rest of us. And with that out of the way, let's get started. The Naruto CCG started with a little set called Path to Hokage. Funnily enough, despite being the very first set ever created, it is also well known for having some of the most popular and powerful cards in the entire game. At this point, the card game is brand new and the deck size is a strict 40 cards, not a single card more or less. On top of this, there was also a strict 25 ninja limit to each deck. Setting a hard ninja cap like this established something very important about the game. Deploying ninjas every turn is vital. Let me set up a scenario for you. Your opponent goes first and plays a Sasuke. On your first turn, you didn't get a zero drop, so you decide to pass the turn. On your opponent's second turn, they play Sakura. Your opponent attacks with both ninjas, getting them two battle rewards. Keep in mind, you are now one-fifth of the way to losing the entire game. On your second turn, though, you manage to get your own Sasuke. Now at this point, you can attack. The best case scenario here is Sasuke blocks, you both get injured, and you're both taken down to injured status, which means you're both a zero. The problem here is once you do that, your opponent can attack with both ninjas next turn along with whatever other ninja they decide to play, so you're actually at a disadvantage because then all three of their ninjas will be able to defeat you. You decide that the best course of action here is to pass. On your opponent's turn, they get Iruka. At this point, your opponent pairs up Iruka with Sakura, and now attacks with both teams. Now we have a bit of a problem. We can block Sasuke to Sasuke to stop them from getting a battle reward, but Sasuke is now our only chance of actually creating a team to come back into the game with, so unfortunately we have to let them get two more battle rewards. On our turn, we get an Iruka. We team up Sasuke and Iruka, and now we have a team of four. Once again, we do have a bit of an offensive we can attack with, but it will require a tie. We're now so far behind, we might as well start weakening their field a bit, so we decide to attack with our team of four. Our opponent makes Sakura the head ninja of their team and defends, so Sakura gets injured. On your opponent's next turn, they drop Haku. I could keep going here, but I think everybody gets the picture. Missing that one ninja drop put us out of a majority of the game, even though now we're playing the exact same ninjas. To avoid this outcome, that 25 ninjas limit was crucial to stick to, and of those 25 ninjas, a majority of them had to be turn zero ninja. This would also introduce two of the most important and relevant pieces of information for building a Naruto deck, first of which being the concept known as the 7-8 stack. These were small clumps of cards that built a specific purpose within your deck. At this point in the game, most positions had three cards that you could easily pick out and make a stack out of. You would use three of whatever the best one is, and then either 2-2 two, two of the other two, or 3-2 two, depending on what kind of stack you were using. In the case of Turn Zero Ninja, the seventh stack was more preferred. The relevant Turn Zero Ninjas were as follows. Vanilla, Naruto, and Sasuke actually weren't too bad at this point. They were the only two Turn Zero cards that could be a consistent three combat without having some kind of horrible downside. An interesting thing about their synergy is that Naruto is better if you're going first, because you can block any of your opponent's attacks without any repercussion, but Sasuke is better if you're going second, because he is the strongest level 0 vanilla and you can attack right out the gate. Some people ran both, but most people would choose one or the other based on their playstyle. That being said though, there was another turn 0 Naruto that was more popular than the vanilla, so most people ran Sasuke and this. When this Naruto is injured and alone, his power is equal to the number of cards in your hands, and of course, during the first 2-3 turns, he's going to be a 5 or a 6, which is very, very powerful. Of course, he's going to fall off in usefulness later on in the game, because you'll really want to be stacking your ninjas together in teams, and he's not much of a team player, but at that point, you can really just use him to block an incoming attack and save you from losing some battle rewards. Konohamaru was a very, 
very popular two of in most competitive decks, because he reduces the entrance cost of ninjas in your hand by one if they're Jonin or higher rank. Since Jonin start showing up around turn 4, this lets you play those Jonin on turn 3, which not only saves you from missing a drop in some cases, but also lets you get your Jonin out before your opponent. Kaede, while being slightly less popular because of her stats, was actually an interesting tech. She lets you draw a card immediately when she was played, and then if she left the field for any reason, you would discard a card from your hand. Since the card you discarded was your choice and not random, this actually usually worked in your advantage. The last card I'll mention here is Sakura Haruno, which... She was only really used very nichely, because if you played her on the first turn, you could block with her and keep her one support stat. This might look like a weird option now, but keep in mind that at the time, this could still step over Konohamaru, it could step over Kaede, and it could even tie with Naruto. Plus, if your opponent did happen to drop a Sasuke, you could block it with absolutely no problem and take that injured status, because there was no loss to your support whatsoever. Then on the next turn, when you dropped your own Sasuke, you could step over their Sasuke, and later on in the game you could separate Sakura and use her as a chump blocker. So now you would pick your three favorites and run three of one and two of the others. But we still have 18 slots to fill, and how do we do it? That's an easy one. Ninja Selection was built on something called The Curve. Lots of card games use The Curve, mostly mana-based games, but the way it normally works is you start off with really big numbers, and then the higher the cost, the smaller the numbers get. But Naruto worked a little bit differently. You start with our 7 turn zeros, of course, but then you use a smaller number for the turn 1s, and then an even smaller number on the turn 2s, and possibly the same on the turn 3s. But after that, you want the numbers to start getting bigger. That way, if something happens to your late game team, then you can start using more late game stuff. Unlike lower games where lower cost characters can be played in multiples during the late game, you only get one ninja to play every single turn in the Naruto card game, so Past turn 3 or 4, you don't want to be seeing any more lower cost ninjas. You want to consistently be playing higher number ninjas so you can keep up with your opponent and eventually win. This idea was so prevalent in the game that some people argued that the ninja limit should be raised to 30 rather than 25. As having the extra 5 slots was important to some players for consistency, but this is a basic spreadsheet of what it would look like to build a deck during the first set. But we're left with a question. What element is the best element? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the next type of card, the Jutsu. And of course, you can't talk about Set 1 Jutsu without first looking at water-style Giant Vortex Jutsu. At the time, this card was the checkmate. If one side got this off, then this was pretty much the GG. Sure, there were ways to come back from it, but in some cases your opponent would literally just scoop if you played this card. Oddly enough, this wasn't the most powerful Jutsu card at the time, but it was the card that decided a lot of games. But if you want to see truly broken, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I present to you 8 Trigram Divination. You have to understand something about this card. From the very first set to the very, very last set of Naruto, this is still considered one of the most powerful cards in the entire game. The reason being, it does a lot more than the creators intended it to. A Jonin or higher ninja can use this to move one ninja to the top of its original owner's deck. Let's just go over all of the things that this does. The most obvious way you can use it is you can use it to get rid of one ninja in the team fighting against you to make it a victory. Another use was, if your opponent blocked with a small ninja because they were afraid of blocking with their main team, this could still target a ninja in their main team and put it on top of the deck, and then if you were attacking with another ninja that was guaranteed to get a battle reward that turn, then it would actually take that ninja as a battle reward. If a ninja has an effect that is absolutely destroying you, then you can pop that ninja off of the field and its effect no longer applies. But by far, it's most cancerous use was to stop your opponent from playing a powerful jutsu like Giant Water Vortex. Imagine for a second you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh, but in this version of Yu-Gi-Oh, monsters themselves have to cast spells. So in this case, we decide to play Solar Recharge, and Raiden is the caster of the spell. You pay its cost and wait for your opponent's response. In this case, your opponent responds with Raigeki Break. 
Now, if you used Raigeki Break to try and destroy Solar Recharge in regular Yu-Gi-Oh, it wouldn't necessarily work, because Solar Recharge's only use is to apply that effect onto the stack, and regardless of whether or not the card itself is destroyed, the effect has already been applied, so the effect will still go off because nothing is negating it. But in this version of Yu-Gi-Oh, I use Raigeki Break to destroy not Solar Recharge, but Raiden. Now that Raiden has been destroyed, there's no longer someone using Solar Recharge, so Solar Recharge doesn't have its effect go off even though we paid for it. Imagine for a second if this is how the game was actually played. It would make spot removal and monster removal much, much more prevalent, because you could stop your opponent from casting their spells by destroying the monster that was using them. Well, that version of Yu-Gi-Oh does exist, it's just called Naruto. By using 8 Trigrams to get rid of their ninja that's currently using a Jutsu card, not only are they out the chakra that they paid for the Jutsu with, but the ninja is gotten rid of, and the Jutsu is negated by default because there's no longer a ninja casting it. Despite how game-ending Giant Vortex Jutsu was, 8 Trigrams is undoubtedly the king of all Jutsu in the first set. Regardless of what kind of deck you use, it has to be a fire deck that can effectively use 8 Trigram. The last meta-creating Jutsu is Sharingan-Ai, which is a very, very effective way to get rid of a Jutsu card. Now, considering how potent the two Jutsu I just showed you are, you can imagine how important it was to run some Sharingan-Ai. The cost of one fire and one colorless made it a very splashable card. And at the time, playing two for a card to negate a jutsu was actually pretty good, especially because it discarded the target afterwards. So not only is their jutsu negated, but it doesn't become chakra, and it's much better than the alternative we had, hidden mist jutsu. Ugh. Two specific water chakra, and all it did was negate the jutsu and put it back in their hand. The immediate problem with this is apparent right from the get-go. If you're putting the card back in their hand, they can just play it again. Sure, they have to pay the cost twice, but why even make it an option? Why not just use Sharingan Eye to get rid of the Jutsu altogether? Besides, even if they choose not to play it again, it's gonna be in their hand. They can still use it as Chakra to pay for an entrance cost, or they can just wait until they do have enough chakra and play it again. I shouldn't even be looking at this card, nobody used it. The only reason we have to look at it here is so you have a sense of just how much more powerful Sharingan Eye was than our alternative. And as far as meta goes, that's kind of it. At this point in the game, powerful jutsu define the meta, and Fire Water has the absolute best jutsu in the game. So you either played a Fire Water deck, or you lost to people who played Fire Water decks. Ironically, the reason you had to play a Fire Water deck at this point was because you had to deal with your opponent's Fire Water deck when they started casting their jutsu. You needed the Sharingan Eye to get rid of their 8 Trigrams, and you needed the 8 Trigrams to get rid of people using Water Style. Since we have 15 cards to work with, our rule of 7 and 8s come back, and we either run 8 Jutsu and 7 Missions, or 7 Jutsu and 8 Missions. Usually the 7 Jutsu is more popular, because the 8 Mission cards could get you the Chakra to actually use the Jutsu to push you into winning the game. There were also some Mad Men who only ran 24 Ninjas so they could run an 8-8 of Jutsu and Missions, but that was very rare and hard to come by. You may have already guessed it, but the regular stack at the time was 3 8 Trigram, 2 Sharingan Eye, and 2 Vortex. These Jutsu were so prominent that most competitive games, nobody cast a single Jutsu throughout the entire game, and then about 7 or 8 turns into the game, both teams would go at it, and each side would just start casting Jutsu like crazy, and whoever won that Jutsu exchange won the entire game. It might sound boring here, but it was surprisingly fun to watch. It was like watching two gunslingers waiting for the right moment to finally shoot the opponent and win the duel. Now that we understand that the meta is a fire-water deck, let's take a look at some of the ninjas who influenced it. The first ninja we have to look at should be obvious. Think for a second. We need a Jonin who has Sharingan Eye, and you guessed it, Kakashi was unintentionally the king of the metagame. He could use all of our jutsu, and he had a pretty decent stat line. There were three Kakashis to choose from, and this one was kind of the most common one. 
cheap jutsu that gave you a stat boost was kind of a popular way to play sometimes, and if you happen to have this Kakashi, then he would get the benefits as well. And if your opponent's Kakashi happened to bust out a Lightning Blade to get that plus 7, then you would also get that plus 7 without even having to play a Lightning Blade. This Kakashi also saw a decent amount of play, but the problem here is there aren't very many Genin that you want as your back ninjas, so it sort of went unnoticed until later on in the game, but at this point in the game it's still decent, just not as decent as our other Kakashis. Now that we've seen the turn 5 Kakashis, let me introduce you to the man, the myth, the legendary Kakashi turn 4. Yes, I am being absolutely serious. This, in a lot of cases, was the most powerful of Kakashi in the first set. No effects, weaker stat line, still better. He's a turn 4 Kakashi with no entrance cost. He still has the 3 support, so he's still good in the back. And if you had Konohamaru in play, he was coming out on turn 3. So on turn 3, you had access to all of the jutsu in your deck, and because he doesn't have an entrance cost, he was very easy to splash. So if you decided you didn't want to use fire water and you wanted to use fire and something else, this Kakashi was still good. He was also great for a nightmare scenario that Naruto players are all too familiar with. Uh oh, you're attacking with a team of 14? That sure is scary. <sighs> I have no choice but to block with my injured Kakashi. It's a shame. He's one of my favorite cards and now I have to sacrifice him off like some worthless Sakura. <sighs> well, I guess I gotta ask for no reason in particular. Do you do anything during the Jutsu phase? You don't? Of course not, that would be silly. I'm just an injured Kakashi after all. Although, looking over my hands, I actually see something here that I think I think I want to play before Kakashi goes. Water Vortex. Response. This is the stuff of nightmares. There is no good move you can make here. You're trapped. If you use your own Water Vortex to counter his Water Vortex, you're wasting it on one injured ninja that's going to go back to their hand and they're just going to play it again. It doesn't have a hand cost, so it's not like you're costing them anything. You don't have a Sharingan Eye Ninja, so that's out. You could 8 Trigrams, I guess, but do you really want to have to waste an 8 Trigrams on an injured Kakashi? It's so asinine. Even if you do figure out a way to get rid of the Water Vortex Jutsu, you're really just going to be killing Kakashi, and it is not, it, it's not worth it. Anything you do in this scenario is not worth it. They've got you by the balls. And it's the little moments like this that make the game so gosh darn fun. We also can't ignore the fact that Fire also had the third Hokage. At this point in the game, a regular team consists of a combat, six ninja, and two three support ninjas. So the fact that Fire had access to a ninja with four support, for the time, was actually pretty busted. On top of that, every single turn you could pay one chakra to heal one of your injured ninjas. I'm telling you, Fire just did it all. So you wanted to run 3rd Hokage and Kakashi, and that was essentially your core. Another important late game pick was going to be your Zabuza. This was the most powerful and also the most popular Zabuza at the time, because if a ninja was damaged in any way by this ninja's team, then it's just discarded instead of injured. This made healing through the third Hokage impossible, and it also made it so your opponent couldn't just chump block with a ninja, because if they blocked with a ninja, that ninja was dead forever. Some people also opted to run this Zabuza, but it wasn't very common. It's a 5-2, and it does make all of your opponent's ninjas minus one, minus one. But the problem here is we have another pick in Haku that was very often used, and so if your opponent happened to have a Zabuza and Haku team, they actually wouldn't take the minus two penalty. They might get a minus one penalty from whoever the third ninja was, but you were actually losing more than your opponent. The minus one combat doesn't help either. <laughs> we have absolute jokes like this. Look at this guy. He's a 5-1, so he's not even like a 5-3 useful ninja like Kakashi. And the artwork is absolutely hilarious because he's just got this really sad look on his face, very weakly holding his sword behind his back. Even the flavor text makes him sound like a loser. It's over. We used to call this puppy dog eyes Zabuza back in the day, man. It's, it's so funny that he even exists. The only other important water ninja we had at the time was Haku. On turn 3, he gave 3 support, which is pretty decent. His effect, oddly enough, in this 
portion of the game isn't good at all because it does make it so that your jutsu can't be negated, but at this point in the game, he's not going to use any jutsu. <laughs> he's not a jonin, so he can't use our eight trigrams, he can't use vortex, and he doesn't have sharingan eyes, so he can't use sharingan. His only other use was if your opponent did happen to use the Mist Zabuza, he didn't get the minus one, minus one, so that's kind of cool, but you really just run him because he's a 4-3 and nothing else. Hopping back to Fire for a second, our other important choice is going to be which Sasuke to use. Sasuke has a bit of relevance here because he can become a user of Sharingan Eye, and since there were already so many good turn zero ninja, we could get away with using a turn one Sasuke. This is the most common. He's a 4-0, but he can't be sent out with any Genin ninjas, which is okay because on turn two, we can start playing Chunin ninja and just using them. This Sasuke had some relevancy too, because if he became the user of Sharingan Eye to negate your opponent's giant water vortex or eight trigrams, your opponent couldn't really do anything about it. They couldn't eight trigrams, and because he couldn't be targeted by eight trigrams, so your opponent just kind of had to let their jutsu get negated. Now finally we can take a look at our mission cards. Once again, fire and water excel in mission cards at this point in the game, and this is by far the most important. Three bingo book. This not only nets you two chakra, but lets you look at the top three cards of your deck for a ninja to put in your hands. And you can of course imagine that this was an important card, because you can't miss any ninja drops and this gets you more ninja. Fire's answer to this was capturing Tora, but capturing Tora just lets you draw a card, which isn't as good as bingo book. Sure, there was that slight off chance that maybe you wouldn't get a ninja in the three cards you looked at with Bingo Book, but that was only going to happen like 5% of the time. If you weren't running water for any reason though, you could run Capturing Tora and it works just fine. Unwanted Child let you not only look at your opponent's battle rewards, but let you take a Zabuza or a Haku and put it back in your hands. The worst client forced your opponent to send out a team to block one of your teams if you attacked and Gato Transport completely gimped both players' chakra area. Fire's missions were just as crazy as their jutsu and their ninja. Makeout Paradise made it so if you defeated or completely defeated another ninja in battle, you still got a battle reward. An accident took away your opponent's jutsu for a turn. Coward made it impossible for your opponent to sacrifice a useless ninja off. Lone Avenger countered one of your opponent's missions. And finally, Exhaustion of Stamina would empty both players' chakra areas, but because this is the mission that got rid of them, this mission would still go in, leaving you one chakra ahead. This was probably the most common two of to have in your deck, because you could empty your opponent's chakra and your own, and then you could just load up your chakra area with some chakra, and then attack, play your jutsu, and your opponent cannot retaliate. So as usual, you would pick your three favorites from the list. 3 of 1, usually bingo book, and then 2 of the other 2, or 3 of 1, again usually bingo book, 3 of another, and then 2 of the last one. Congratulations! You have yourself a competitive Naruto Path to Hokage deck list. Now all of this isn't to say that the other stuff in the set was completely useless, it was just horribly outclassed. Some people would mix it up with jutsu like crystal ball jutsu that let you look at your opponent's hand and draw a card. Thousand Years of Death would let you get one of your opponent's battle rewards back into your hands. Water Prison, which made your opponent's head ninja a zero for the turn. And a surprise, Shared Instinct Assassination, so if your opponent did get scared and send one of their little meat puppets out to block your attack, you could actually get rid of one of their big guys. This would put them one ninja behind you if you and your opponent were keeping pace. Finding ways to sneak some of these surprise techs into your deck was a way to keep the game kind of interesting without becoming completely uncompetitive. And I know some of you are still going to be disappointed. There were five elements released and you had to pick two of them to be competitive. That is a shame. But I want to reiterate that it's not like the other three elements had absolutely nothing going for them, it's just that it was edged out by how unintentionally powerful fire was and how great water vortex jutsu was. If you wanted to play lightning, there was this great little combo between Naruto Imposter and Iruka. Naruto Imposter let you shirk off damage if you flipped a coin and got heads, and even if you did take that damage, you could pass that damage off to Iruka, whose effect was valid so you could have them do this twice. 
It was pretty powerful because it made it so your opponent couldn't really attack into you and you could just build up this field and build up some chakra and then come back in the late game. Naruto also got this pretty neat little mission card that was exclusive to him, where every time he dealt damage to a ninja, you got a plus one plus one token on him so he could just get stronger and stronger. Another thing to note is you could have multiple outcast dreams in play at once, so you could actually have two plus one plus ones or three plus one plus ones every time your Naruto dealt damage. This went along great with cards that forced your opponent to block your teams. Lightning also has Might Guy and Rock Lee. Uh, Rock Lee really sucks at this point, so uh, he's, he's really not worth talking about, but if you do happen to run a Rock Lee, you can also run Might Guy, who acts as a 4 support if you have Rock Lee as your head ninja. Ichiraku Noodle Shop was a great little staple card that just healed a ninja. Lightning was absolutely littered with little jutsu cards that gave you big bonuses. Cross-shaped Shuriken was 2 to get plus 3. Kunai was 1 for 2, and a back row ninja can use it. And the Imposter Naruto we talked about before could use Harem Jutsu, which was extremely powerful at the time. Most head ninja were gonna be male ninja, and this made them a 0-0. So if your opponent had a team of all male ninja, you could essentially wipe out an entire team with this. As great as Kakashi in the third Hokage might be, the Harem Jutsu is just a bit too much. The most unpredictable ninja is one of the cards I was talking about that forces your opponent to block one of your teams. And Disaster of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit, which actually made some players run a Fire Lightning very viably. It deals one damage to every single ninja on the field, so if you already had your opponent down on the ropes, or if you just wanted to finish the game quickly, a quick Disaster of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit, play a ninja, swing in for game, and that was it. This was especially great if you played Disaster of the Nine-Tailed Fox Spirit and then immediately afterwards played the third Hokage because you could just start healing all of your ninja up, but your opponent was just stuck. Earth had some pretty decent stuff too. It had Headhunter Jutsu, which got rid of your opponent's entire back row, and Tree Climbing Training, which turned one chakra into three chakra. It also had Mind Transfer Jutsu, which Admittedly, was a little difficult to pull off at the time, but if you could pull it off, it could take one of your opponent's ninja and move it to your village, which was great. After the battle healed your entire village, Ninja Academy let you summon twice in one turn, Leaf Ninja Forces let players draw two cards instead of one at the beginning of their turns, and Shooting Star essentially let you have two of the same ninja in play, because you could change the name of one of your in-play ninja to Shooting Star, and then play another ninja of that ninja's original name. Two Kakashis in play at once? Yes please! And finally, Winds probably had the most metagame potential out of everything except for Fire. In fact, if Water Vortex hadn't been printed, Wind's Fire would have been the main meta instead of Fire Water. We start with Kurenai, because she's a 3, both healthy and injured, although admittedly you can splash her into anything. Substitution was great because it let you move one of your opponent's back row ninja to being in the front so that you could completely screw over your opponent's team. Usually what would happen here is you'd take a ninja with zero combat and make it the head ninja, so you dealt two damage to the head ninja when you got a complete victory and one damage to both of the back ninja. Disguise Jutsu was very annoying because you could chump block with something that didn't matter and play Disguise Jutsu to just make a battle not happen. One Morning was literally Pot of Greed and therefore very sought after. Specific Instruction let you organize teams during your opponent's turn, so you could do something like split all of your ninjas up and attack separately, and then during your opponent's turn, after you saw what your opponent played, put them back into a team so your opponent couldn't step over you. Three-man squads made it so your opponent couldn't block your teams for a turn. Inner Sakura was an arguably powerful card, because it let you look at the top four cards of your deck, rearrange them, and put them back, so it let you see what your opponent was going to take as battle rewards, and if you had a Sakura in play, you could draw one of those cards. The main problem we had at the time is all of the Sakuras at this point in the game were pretty worthless, except maybe for the 1101 vanilla, because you could block with it and still have the one support. Finally, we have my personal favorite mission card of the set, Left Behind. Separating one of your opponent's most powerful ninja from the team is such a powerful effect, because after it's separated, you can then separate your teams according to your opponent's new team power and potentially send out three teams. 
And honestly, there's not much your opponent can do about it. They can block if they really want to, but they're probably going to get some of their ninjas injured, and it's probably late enough in the game now that they're not going to want to just give you the battle rewards. It can sometimes just be the trump card that wins you the game, and I think that's pretty cool.